Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass on Stroke and Transient Ischemic Attack. TIA, or Transient Ischemic Attack, was originally defined as a sudden onset of focal neurological symptoms and or signs lasting less than 24 hours of presumed vascular origin. Stroke was defined as an onset of focal neurological signs and symptoms lasting more than 24 hours of presumed vascular origin. The time limit was intended to separate ischemia without infarction from infarction. However, the time-based definition of TIA is considered inadequate as a risk of tissue infarction when focal neurological symptoms occur can occur with even less than one hour of symptoms. As a result, a revised tissue-based diagnosis of TIA is a transient episode of neurological dysfunction caused by focal central nervous system ischemia without acute infarction. And uh, consequently, the definition of a stroke is an infarction of the central nervous system tissue attributable to ischemia based on neuroimaging and or clinical evidence of permanent injury, signs or symptoms. A stroke can be ischemic or hemorrhagic. They are predominantly ischemic where 85% of all strokes caused by a blockage in the vessels either from thrombosis or an embolus, either a blood clot, fat, air or clumps of bacteria. Hemorrhagic strokes, which account for 15% of strokes, are caused by ruptured blood vessels leading to reduced blood flow, and these can result in intracerebral hemorrhage bleeding within the brain or subarachnoid hemorrhage bleeding on the surface of the brain. When examining a patient with a stroke, let's think about the common signs that we're likely to elicit. A stroke results from an upper motor neuron sign, and that's because the disturbance in the neural pathway is proximal to the anterior horn of the spinal cord. So the signs that we would expect, we would not expect fasciculations that you see in lower motor neuron conditions, nor would we expect marked wasting, but disuse atrophy. We would expect an increase in tone, a pyramidal pattern of weakness, meaning that the extensors would be likely to be weaker in the upper limbs and the flexor weaker in the lower limbs. A pronated drift may be present. The reflexes, the deep tendon reflexes would be increased, brisk, hyperreflexic, and the presence of clonus. We'd expect a loss of the superficial reflexes and the Babinski sign would likely be positive, i.e. an upgoing plantar or an extensor response of the hallux. On inspection of this patient, you can see that the right arm and forearm is flexed, the shoulder is flexed, the elbow is flexed, the digits and the thumbs are flexed. And this is because the right upper limbs are affected more than the flexors. So the flexors are relatively preserved and that's why the patient assumes a flex position in the upper limbs. And this is classical of a pyramidal pattern of weakness. If you compare that to the legs, where pyramidal weakness suggests that the limb flexors are affected more than the extensors, we would expect extension. So a patient with a lower limb stroke would likely have an extended hip extended knee, extended ankle. When we examine the tone, there would, we would expect increased tone and spasticity throughout with evidence of clonus on, in the right ankle. More than five beats would be pathological. And on the contralateral side, we would expect normal tone. Just a reminder that tone, hypertonia can be categorized as spasticity or rigidity. Spasticity is associated with pyramidal lesions like a stroke and rigidity with extrapyramidal lesions such as in Parkinson's disease. Spasticity is velocity dependent, meaning the faster the limb is moved, the worse the hypertonia, whereas in rigidity, which is velocity independent, however fast the limb is moved, the degree of hypertonia is maintained. Spasticity involves an initial movement which is slowest due to a more marked increase in tone at the beginning of movement, class 9 spasticity, whereas in rigidity there's uniform uh, tone throughout the movement known as lead pipe rigidity. The power in the limbs is graded according to the MIC scale which has 0 to 5, 0 being no contraction and 5 being normal power. With pyramidal patterns of weakness in the upper limbs, where the extensors are weaker, you'd have a power of perhaps 3 out of 5, and the flexors would be relatively preserved with a power of 4 out of 5. But the assessment will be relatively difficult due to the paresis, and the power in the contralateral arm would be normal. A pronator drift may be present, and this is because in pyramidal lesions, the pronator muscles are relatively stronger than the supernator muscles. In the lower limbs, where 
in a pyramidal pattern of weakness, the flexors are weaker than the extensors, you would expect the flexors to have power of 3 out of 5 and the extensors to have a power 4 out of 5 on the MRC scale and the contralateral leg, if not affected, would have normal power. Reflexes, hyperreflexia would be noted in the affected side, so the right arm brachial radialis, biceps and triceps would exert hyperreflexia. In the lower limbs, the knee reflex and ankle reflex would be brisk, and an upgoing plantar or Babinski positive would be observed with normal reflexes on the contralateral side. In, uh, in stroke, coordination assessment can be difficult due to limited movement. Sensation can be affected or normal depending on where the stroke has led to cerebral damage. Pinprick sensation assesses the spinothalamic tracts and vibration sense assesses the dorsal columns. There are several key dermatomes which can be assessed to determine whereabouts the lesion is in a dermatomal pattern. C5, which can be tested by assessing uh, sergeant's patch. C6, the uh, thumb. C7, the uh, middle finger. C8, the small finger. And T1 and T2 can be examined with the medial forearm and arm respectively. When you examine a patient's gait with stroke, you'd expect an abnormal circumduction gait. And this is due to the pyramidal pattern of weakness resulting in leg extension. If the leg is completely extended, it means that the, the affected leg is relatively longer and extended, in, which would require the patient to form a semicircle with that leg in order to move and ambulate. And that's known as a circumduction gait or a spastic gait. So what are the risk factors for a stroke? heart disease, ischemia, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, any vasculopathic features increase the risk of stroke. A pre smoking, a previous TIA, excessive alcohol intake, a hypercoagulable state, a carotid stenosis or poor ventricular function, drugs such as a combined oral contraceptive pill or a family history of stroke all increase the risk, the risk of developing a stroke. The symptoms may present as sudden onset weakness, sensory disturbance, visual disturbance, speech disturbance, ataxia, clumsiness, dysphagia, or even an altered level of consciousness, or in the context of a hemorrhagic stroke, severe pain. We use a Bamford classification of strokes, which is prognostically and etiologically useful. Bamford classification classifies strokes as either tax, pax, pocky, or lucky, which stands for total anterior circulation stroke, partial anterior circulation stroke, posterior circulation infarct, or a lacuna infarct. In a total anterior circulation stroke, the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery are affected, and you're likely to have unilateral hemiparesis and or hemicentry loss of the face, arm, and leg, with homonymous hemianopia, as well as higher cognitive dysfunction. Whereas in a PAX or a partial anterior circulation stroke in which the smaller vessels of the middle cerebral artery and the smaller vessels of the anterior cerebral artery are affected, you're likely to have two of those three criteria, either unilateral hemiparesis with homonymous hemianopia or higher cognitive dysfunction. A POCI or posterior cir circulation infarct is where the vertebral basilar arteries are affected, leading to either cerebellar or brainstem syndromes with uh, loss of consciousness or an isolated homonymous hemianopia. With lacuna infarcts, in which the small lacuna vessels are affected, you would not expect any higher cortical dysfunction and the stroke may be pure sensory, pure motor, or a mixture, a sensory motor stroke, or may result in ataxic hemiparesis. And actually, lacuna infarcts are a common type of ischemic stroke which result from the occlusion of the small penetrating arteries that provide blood to the brain's deep structures. And that's why patients don't suffer from higher cortical function loss, such as dysphagia or neglect. Within the lacuna infarcts, as mentioned, there's pure motor strokes, which result in hemiparesis, paralysis, or weakness, hemiplegia. And usually the structures affected are the pons, the internal capsule, or the corona radiata. In a pure sensory lacuna infarct, which is manifested as a marked loss of sensation on one side of the body. The structure affected is usually the contralateral thalamus, the internal capsule, the coronary radiator, or the midbrain. In a combination of these, a number of those structures can be affected. In the 
uh, ataxic hemiparesis type of lacuna infarct. This, uh, the manifestation is with cerebellar and motor symptoms, including weakness and clumsiness. And this is usually because the internal capsule pons or coronary radiator are affected or the red nucleus. There are specific stroke syndromes, such as lateral medullary syndrome. This was first described by Adolf Wallenberg, who was a German physician, um, who described this syndrome caused by an acute infarct of the lateral medulla oblongata. And this occurs due to the occlusion of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery and its branch, and occurs in patients who have risk factors such as hypertension, smoking and diabetes. The clinical presentation of lateral medullary syndrome is vertigo, veering towards the side of the lesion, diplopia nystagmus, which are cerebellar signs, along with ipsilateral Horner's syndrome and loss of pain and temperature sensation over the contralateral side of the body and ipsilateral side of the face. The radiographic features of lateral medullary syndrome, MRI with diffusion weighted imaging is a a very good tool to confirm the infarct in the lateral medulla and the infarcted area has a high diffusion weighted imaging signal and low on apparent diffusion coefficient. The investigations for patients with stroke include a range of blood tests, but importantly, urgent CT brain scans, MRI and MRI scans, including carotid dopplers, and assessing the the cardiac function looking for signs of uh, a stroke, uh, looking for signs of a, a thrombus, a 24-hour tape looking for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, as well as an echo to look for any signs that may predispose the patient to developing a blood clot. Managing patients with stroke is a multidisciplinary, holistic, emergent approach. Uh, a, B, C, D approach and an urgent CT brain to exclude hemorrhage. The airway needs to be protected. Occasionally gentle suction or airway adjuncts may be necessary. Breathing supplemental oxygen can be provided if required. And circulation, the blood pressure tends to rise with ischemic strokes and it's important not to drop the blood pressure too quickly, otherwise you can risk a watershed stroke. D includes monitoring the neuro observations and the blood sugars and to ensure that they're maintained between 4 and 11 and an urgent MRI, Doppler's tapes and other investigations including cholesterol to help manage. If the stroke is determined to be ischemic and, and the patient presents within four and a half hours and investigations are organised by this time, thrombolysis management can be instituted if there are no contraindications, otherwise antiplatelet therapy is administered. It's important for stroke management, the time of onset is documented and ascertained very clearly. The thrombolysis window is there for patients who present four and a half hours from the last known normal neurology. So if a patient wakes up and they've been asleep for several hours, then even if the symptoms are picked up as soon as they wake up, the last known neurological, normal neurological time was when they went to sleep. The MDT involved includes the doctors, the stroke nurses, the speech and language therapists to assess swallow to make sure the patients are not developing uh, an unsafe swallow that can lead to recurrent aspiration, physiotherapy to help gain muscle strength, social services and counselling. It's important to have a holistic approach and remember that if the patient drives and presents with TIAs or strokes, it's important that they do not drive until they've been fully investigated. And here the DVLA demonstrates that if a patient is a bus coach or lorry driver, then you must inform uh, the DVLA that you have uh, a license to carry public passengers. Thank you very much for attending this Medicine Masterclass.